So proud of you all tonight being here. And um, we've had a long break, but appreciate you all always come back in strong numbers. And I'm so proud of you. And you have no idea what I'm going to talk about tonight. But you still come back. And I don't tell y'all what I'm going to talk about from week to week because I don't want you to be topic driven. Only come to church when it's your topic. Because that's how church folk are. Y'all do know that's how church people are. But I'm going to talk about something tonight. Oh, actually, over the next several weeks, I guess I am kind of telling you a little bit, I'm going to deal with different areas around the idea of relationships. Amen. Yeah, relationships. Why can't we just get along? And I'm just talking about to your spouse. Come on, talk to me for just a second. We can't get along. And um, I want to talk about this in many, many aspects. It's something that's a burden on my heart because almost every day I'm getting more and more calls and emails and letters and discussions about it all boils down to relationships, marital relationships, singles relationships. Um, people have conflict. They got into an argument with somebody. They're not talking. Um, they don't know how to resolve it. Um, just relationships. Um, tonight I want to talk about, let me see where the single people are. Where the single people, all the single people, hold up your hand. It's a whole heap of, a whole heap of y'all here. Lord Jesus. Um, I want to talk about discerning a life partner. Now, to the married people who already got a partner, I think this is, this is relevant because um, some of you got friends who are using the wrong criteria to determine who they should be married to. Thank all both of y'all. Thank you, baby. I appreciate it. Thank you. And um, some of you got kids. One of my kids who just got married, I'm going to call Joshua by name. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's our job as parents to teach your children how to discern who God's partner is for their life. Amen. Yeah. It's a grandparent's job. So, I mean, what I, what I want to give you today is how you can... You know, I've talked about this a hundred times, but I, I, I've been telling people, go to the bookstore. You try to figure out if you should marry this person, go to the bookstore. Go get, I did a tape on it. They couldn't find it. And I went through my notes. I couldn't find the time where I actually gave the five teachings, the five points. I'm going to give you five points tonight to look at. Well, you said before, I've added a fifth. <laughs> so some of you heard this before, but jot this down. Maybe you don't feel the need for it in your life right today. But I assure you, you're going to come across somebody who want to want to know. And you, you can be the instrument that God uses to give them a sense of direction. Not that they have to take your advice or what I say. But I see too many people making the wrong choices and decisions on who they're going to get married to. Amen. 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 And I feel it's our assignment, um, my assignment, to try to make sure that you're equipped. And... Uh, and then later on through the next several weeks, we're going to talk about various aspects of relationships, both in marriage and just in human beings. Rela I want you all to jot this down. Relationships are important to God. Write that down. Relationships are important to God. I've been saying that for the last few weeks. As a matter of fact, I've been saying it for years. I've been saying it for a long time. Relationships are important to God. Every major thing that I've had in my life, every major place I've gone, every major door that has opened, 
took place because of some key relationships. That's why you got to be careful how you treat somebody because you don't know what role they might play in your future. Amen. Yep. Yeah, somebody who you just cussed out might be your boss next week. Or be somebody who got a job that you need, but because you were nasty and they remembered you. Well, yep, that's the girl with the pink hair. She the one who I remember her. So it's important that you, you remember that. And relationships are important to God. All right, now I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I'm going to go through some things here that you're not going to like. Took y'all too long to say that's all right. Took y'all way too long. I'm telling you, some of y'all not going to agree with it, but hey, all I can ask you to do is search the scriptures. Amen. And make that determination. So the key point I want you to get, and don't remember, uh, don't forget this. I'm saying don't remember. Don't forget relationships are important to God. Even, even relationships that you think don't need to continue on, even how you end a relationship is important. Because you, you never can tell. You might leave a job and might have to come back to get that job. So um, it's important. But today I want to talk about discerning God's partner for your life. Because getting married to the wrong person can jack up your life. Oh yeah, it can mess you up. Um, and some people have done that. They've, they've, but here's the, here's the thing, and this is especially to the singles. Um, it's important that, that, that by you being a believer and a Christian, that um, you walk into, for the rest of your life, with an understanding of understanding how God will communicate to you what your life, what and who your life partner might be, and that you're looking at, at, at his way. See, what I want to do is I want to walk in God's perfect will for my life. I want to be downtown, will of God, in the center of God's will. I don't want to be off on the side street. I don't want to be in the vicinity. I want to be right down in the middle of God's will for my life. Because, um, you, know, you, you know, marriage is one of those things, when you get into it, it's an institution. God does not make a way out. I knew y'all weren't going to say amen on that point. Oh, no, it's, from God's vantage point, you are entering into an institution that God says, once you've been joined together, let no man put you asunder. It's for better, for worse. Y'all said it when y'all got married. You raised your hand through, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Did y'all say that? Did y'all say that? Why y'all looking at me like y'all didn't say that? That means when worse comes, in our premarital classes, well, I, I, I don't know if they do it now, but I know I used to do it. I used to ask them the question, what's the worst thing that you can see happen? And if that happens, you're saying, for better or for worse, if that happens, I'm still going to be here. See how y'all amens getting lower and lower and lower? So I'm saying to the singles, you better figure that out that if the worst happens with this person I'm thinking about getting married to, am I willing to stick with it, stay in there, go through thick and thin, richer for poor, with a job, without a job, through for better, for worse, richer or poor, till death do you part. That's why I told First Lady, I tell people all over the country, when she decided she was going to leave me, I walked right in that closet behind her, broke out my suitcase, said, I'm sick and tired of this mess too, I'm going with you, where you going? And that's the only she can't she she cannot leave me because we made a promise till death do us part. Now marriage is hard enough with somebody who God selected for you. What if you get hooked up and jacked up with somebody that God did not even didn't even have in the vicinity for you?
So we want you to look at the institution of marriage. People treat marriage so lackluster today. Don't treat it like that. Don't, you don't jump up and say, if you don't marry me today, I ain't gonna never get married to you. What? No, 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 no. This is a sacred institution. And it's one that God will move. Let me tell you something about you people who, like a lot of people have been coming to me for counseling and they want me to give them the amen to divorce. Look at your neighbor right now and say, the, devil is, the pastor is never going to give you an amen to get divorced. <laughs> now, there's one, I, that's not right, hold up, let me give you the, hold up, I didn't give it straight, hold on, hold on. There is a condition, I would tell you. It's the only biblical condition I know. If you married Jane, but Jane was born Jack, I'm telling y'all, y'all better get some childhood pictures. I'm telling you right here, right now. Uh, let me see you when you was in elementary school, please. Please don't write me no emails, don't send me no letters, don't get mad at me. This is what I believe. I'm, I'm entitled to my beliefs and my convictions. I'm entitled to it. You may not like it but I'm entitled to it. All right, here we go. Here's number one. I'm just running my mouth like I got all night. I can't take my time, and y'all know that. How do you discern God's will? How do you know what God's will is? How do you know who that person is that God has for you? I'm glad you asked the question. Here's the first point, parental blessings. Do you have the blessings of your parents? Now, I know people don't like that, but this is one of the channels that God uses to give clear instructions. Proverbs 21 and 1 is a cornerstone verse for my life. I've talked about this a hundred times. Here's what it says. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Oh, my gosh. That is so profound. Here's what that means. The person who is in the position of authority, that's who the king represents, their heart is in God's hands. And God directs their heart wherever he wants. Just like he directs the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. He can turn the heart of, of, of the parent in the direction he wants it to go. And Ephesians 6 and 1 talks about children obey your parents. That's Ephesians 6 and 1. That, that's clear, with clarity of heart and mind, God uses parents to give directions in your life in this specific arena of life is um, for marriage. Now, I'm grateful to the Lord that when I was courting Mrs. Trina Prather, Miss Trina Prather. My father, I wanted to get some clarity from him, and at, at some point before we get married, he said to me, I'm glad you chose Trina. Aww. Yes. Yeah, oh. Because he knew I had hundreds of women coming after me. And out of all of the women that I had to choose from, he said, I'm glad you chose that one. Amen. Now, that was an affirmation for me because God had already told me in various ways. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But it would have been, been difficult for me to marry her without his blessings. And, and we live in a culture today where people don't really care what their parents think. But I think it's important that you teach your children and they understand the principle Proverbs 21 and 1 we got a biblical basis of this you know um, sometimes um, 
well, run the joker past your parents up front before you get all entangled. Before they get all, before you get all your heart all into it and before you get pregnant. Come on, talk to me for just a second. <laughs> this is an important point. This is a way of life. It's a way of life. Every major decision I've made, my parents have been involved in it. Um, now, you know, when you get older, you, you, you honor your parents. It's the difference between obeying and honor. When you're a child, you obey. When you get to become an adult, you honor. You give weight. You're not obligated to obey, but you give weight. You give more weight to it than you would as if they, you, you give it more weight than one of your peers. Y'all understand what I'm saying to you today? It's your parents. You give more weight to it. You don't, you don't put their opinion about it in the same category as your homeboys. These are your parents and you're trusting God to give you direction for your life. The, the first place you look to for direction is the word of God. Is it in line with this? And then one of the things he says is do that. Okay, y'all hear what I'm saying today? Okay. So, that, so um, now if you have a parent that is not in support, the timing might be wrong. So it might be, the, might be the right person, but the wrong time. So I say, to, I say to young people who want to get married or anybody who want to get married, their parents are not in support, find out what the issue is. Go sit down and talk to them and find out what is your issue with this person and see if it can be corrected and their hearts changed. Now, if you, if you are dating somebody, courting somebody, I like the word courting better than dating. If you're courting somebody and they're not willing to go to your parents to find out what the issue is, that says a whole lot about them right there on, at, the, at the jump street. They don't care enough about what your parents think that they're not willing to do something to address whatever their concerns are. That says a whole lot. So I would say it may be the time it might be wrong. And the groom, I'm old fashioned. I believe the groom should go to the bride's parents and ask for permission. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Praise the Lord. Thirteen people said, "Praise the Lord." Yeah, it's old-fashioned. The Jews—that's how they did it. Matter of fact, you, we should be glad we're not Jews and we don't live in the Jewish culture. Because back in the day, the Jews, when a, when a man wanted to marry a Jewish daughter, a man's daughter, he he would have to go to the father and pay the father. Matter of fact, they still do that in South Africa right now. Thank the Lord, Pastor Burt was uh, preaching for me Sunday. Appreciate him filling the gap for us on Sunday. My wife and I was having um, um, dinner or breakfast with him and his wife and his son and his wife. And we, we learned uh, in breakfast just last week that um, this, the, the, the groom's family had to pray, pay the bride's family moot money. Ooh, y'all better be glad y'all don't live in South Africa. They still do it over there. You better lift your hands and praise the Lord because if that joker had to pay for you, Now this is this third point under here is the point about um, full blessings. The parents, you should get the parents full blessings. Very important. Not just their consent. There's a difference between consent and full blessings. And let me let me talk a moment about this because a lot of parents. Uh, just go along with it. And I'm saying to you, parents, it's important for parents to determine how God has inclined your heart 
and you're, you're doing your child a disservice by not revealing to them how God has inclined your heart. And there's a lot of parents that are telling their kids, well, do whatever you want to do. That's your life. You pick it. No. You have a role as a parent. You have a responsibility to communicate to them how your heart is inclined. They may not like it. They may not agree. But some of y'all want to stay your, your kids' friends. You're not their friends. You're their parent. And you have a responsibility as a parent. Your responsibility is to communicate how God has inclined your heart. And so tell them how you feel if you're not in support of it and what it is they need to do to bring correction to it. But I'm saying to young people, before you get married, get the full blessings of your parents, not just their consent. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the second point. I'm going to get through this today, so I'm going to speed it up a little, a little here's the second point is the salvation status let me oh can I say something before I go to this can I say this for a second can I can I jump off and chase a little rabbit for a minute I do not believe couples should get married just because one of them because the, the, the woman got pregnant that's not a reason to get married you don't complicate your sin of premarital sex, and it is a sin. Amen. I thought I should have got some amens from the preachers over here, but they didn't say nothing. I think I got one amen over here among the preachers. I thought among anybody I'd get some amens over here. It's too late, Sharon. You should have said it earlier. You don't complicate one sin by going ahead and doing another sin by marrying somebody that God didn't tell you to get married to. I just, I just needed to throw that in there for free. I won't charge you extra for that. I just wanted to throw that in there. So let's talk about salvation status because I think the Bible is crystal clear about this. But unfortunately, some people haven't read the Bible. And some people feel like it's their job to do some missionary dating, some missionary courting. They're going to win them to Jesus on the mission field. But the scriptures are clear on this. And I want y'all to be clear about this. The Bible's crystal clear about this. You don't date somebody believing you can change them. Let me tell you something. Whatever that joker doing before he get married is what he gonna do after he get married. He ain't going to church before you get married. He ain't going to church after you get married. If he don't pray with you before you get married, he ain't gonna pray with you after he get married. Whatever they do in, in, moder in, in moderation they, before, they're going to do in excess after. They drink a little bit before, they're going to drink a whole lot. I'm going to talk about this too. If they lied a little bit before marriage, they're going to lie a whole lot after they get married. They don't like this kind of preaching right here. Because some of the women think they're Jesus to these men, that they can change him. That you can transform him. That you can look at him and see he can be different. God didn't call you to do that. He didn't start. He wasn't a jacked up joker. Let me tell you something. Because you, some of y'all want people to believe before you got saved, he was an angel. And then after y'all got married, he became a devil. Or vice versa. You thought she was an angel. The only thing that changed is you. He got, they, might get, he, they connected with you, if that's the case. But I'm telling you, people put when when you when people when they, when you start dating, you put your best foot forward. You're the best person in the world. You smile. You happy all the time. You clean your room. You know you, when you first start dating and stuff, you do all of that ahead of time. Come on, talk back at me for just a second. But after a while, you start showing your you start showing your true colors. You don't get married to nobody quick. 
You don't, you don't meet them all in January and then in February y'all get married. What? What? Is you crazy? All right, let me get to the scriptures. Second uh, um, Corinthians chapter six. That ain't right. That's it. It should be um, fifteen through six. It should be uh, fourteen through fifteen. That's an error. Here's what it says: Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer with an unbeliever? Amen. Do y'all see that right there? Yes. You're headed in two separate directions. Yes. A believer's going one way, and an unbeliever's going in a different direction. That is not the will of God. Amen. Be clear about that. Let's be crystal clear. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pained when I see so many of these people who are courting folk that are not saved what y'all talking about and I, here's what bothers me I'm sorry y'all y'all caught me on a bad day cuz I'm, I'm so bothered by this here's what's bothering me is when I say, well, is he saved? Or is she saved? I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> what? What the? 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 <laughs> Let me tell you something. You cannot have a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, and something about him doesn't come out sometime in your dialogue with God. Somewhere down along the line, you're going to say, I was in that word today and God spoke to me. Somewhere down along that line, you prayed and asked God to do something for you and you saw he did it and it blew your mind and you can't wait to tell somebody, I prayed about something and God answered it. You can't tell me that you have a walk with God and he's not doing that for you. They'll never bring up Jesus, never bring up their prayer life, never bring up a scripture, never bring up church, never bring up the word, never talk anything about the Lord. It's time to roll on, roll on. What's up, friend? Somebody say, roll on. Roll on. It's time to roll on. Because we headed in two separate directions. Because you're under the lordship of Jesus. And by being his disciple, you're committed to doing whatever he tells you to do. You don't want to be tied to somebody who is not willing to do what you know or believe God is telling you to do. You want God's favor and you want God's blessings on your life and God said do X, Y, and Z but that person said they don't believe in that they ain't going X, Y, and Z and you can't do it or they don't want to do it it's going to create tension. Who wants to get, get entangled in that kind of situation? And by the way, just because they're going to church doesn't mean that they saved. Both people should be saved and both people should be growing. Because if one is growing and the other one is not growing, you still headed in two separate directions. There's tension in the room. I don't know why there's so much tension up in here. So it's not just that they, they saved. But are they growing? One of my children, one of my daughters was dating a young man. I'm not going to call names. But the young man wasn't going to church. That's a problem for me. 
And I'm so proud of her that she says, it's time for me to cut this off. It's time for me to roll on. Roll on. <laughs> Time for, she said, it's time for me to roll. I was so proud of her that she had the wisdom to say, I need somebody who can lead me spiritually. And so they should be growing, but they should also, now here's another issue here, y'all. Let me spend the time talking about them being committed to a local church. And under the authority of a local church, this is important, you all. This is important. My heart bleeds with the number of people who just don't belong to a church. That's, a, that's an issue. Because Jesus is clear that he, he, he is doing and establishing his kingdom through the church. The church is God's institution that he's using. The church. A lot of people don't want to belong to the church because they don't want to be under nobody's authority. Hebrews 13 and 7 says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. You need to be, this is clear, you know, everybody should be submitted under somebody's authority. Verse 17 of the same book. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. I'm, I'm fully persuaded that the church is God's institution and anybody who's not willing to be submitted under a local church, that's a problem of arrogance and independence and, and a lack of being willing to be submitted to somebody. Yeah. Everybody's called to be submitted to somebody. I'm a pastor, but I have a pastor. Right. And I'm submitted to my pastor. Yeah. You should be... A, you're, the person you're looking at dating, according, I, the, the word is not dating, that's the wrong word, according, should be submitted to a, should be saved, growing, and submitted and under the authority of a local church. Right. If they're not saved, roll on. If they're not growing, roll on. Amen. If they're not a member of a local church, roll, roll on. Number three, this is where the tension comes in. Y'all listen to me carefully on this because I don't want nobody to walk out here saying I said something that I didn't say. I'm going to be crystal clear. There's going to be some tension in here. I'm telling you already, it's going to be tension. If you're single, you need to determine in your heart whether or not a person who has been divorced is an option for you to consider marrying. Now the reason I'm talking about that is there's a, there's a lot of controversy about what the Bible teaches about divorce and remarriage. The world says you can divorce and remarry. Elizabeth Taylor told her, each of her eight husbands, I won't be with you too long. <laughs> she got married eight times. Eight times. Eight <laughs> times. Some of y'all been married two and three and four times. It can't be the other person that's always the problem. Anybody that maturity and character is reflected when you can stay with one person for a lifetime.
Y'all see how few claps there, there was on that point right there. That's y'all, this is a serious matter. Y'all not gonna go to heaven and stand before God and have to answer for y'all six marriages and say Pastor Jenkins didn't tell you. I don't compromise on what I believe. Let's open the Bible right here. Let's go to Matthew chapter five. We're gonna read every last one of these verses. I might not get past this today, but Matthew 5.31, here's what it says. Furthermore, it has been said, verse 31, 32, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, now everybody like to go to that fifth, that middle, that verse, that, that middle part of verse 32 about sexual immorality and what it means. That's a whole nother teaching. And I could spend the rest of the day telling you what that means. I don't have time to do it today. A lot of people think it simply means adultery. Let me tell you why I don't believe it means adultery. Because Jesus said, if you look on a woman with lust, you already committed adultery. That means everybody will have an excuse for divorce. Because everybody done looked at somebody in the wrong way. Have you, Deacon Johnson, looked at a woman in the... <laughs> huh? Yes, sir. Thank you. Have you, Elder Barham? That's a good answer, Elder Barham. <laughs> Have you looked at another person in, 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 a, in a lustful way? Hold on, Pastor. <laughs> Hold on, he said. <laughs> Have you, Paul Chapman? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for telling the truth. <laughs> Have you, Reverend, S Reverend Sims, I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> we think you God. We think you're the next thing to God, Reverend Sims. We're not going to ask you. I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose my thing with Reverend Sam's. We're going to roll on to something else. Yes, Pastor. <laughs> have you looked at a man in a way you shouldn't have looked at him? <laughs> you do know. She said no. You know lying is a sin. Don't you know that? <laughs> the truth of the matter is all of us have looked at somebody in a way that we shouldn't have looked at he could not have possibly meant. If that's the case, everybody can get a divorce. That's, that's not the intent of God. That, that has another meaning. It means, you know, it means, here's what it means in, in a nutshell. When a, when, a, when a man went and paid the father for the dowry, paid the money for the, for the woman, you know, remember they had to pay. And then he went away and got a house ready and came back to get the bride. And when he came back to get her, if he discovered on the wedding night she was not a virgin, he could break off the agreement, get his money back, divorce her, put her away. That's what it means. Now, every other place this is mentioned in Scripture it doesn't use that, that's called the exception clause. It's not in, there's no other, it's not in Mark, not in Luke, not in any of the other gospels. This clause is only in Matthew. Matthew is written to Jews. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't a Jew, it ain't meant for you. <laughs> Do y'all understand what I'm saying to you? Do y'all get that? So, um, I'm, let's go, let's roll on. Let's go to chapter 19. Let's go to Matthew 19. Let's just read all of these real quick. I'm probably not going to get past these verses. Verses. I don't have time to read verses 1 through 12. Um, all right, we ain't got nowhere to go. Go ahead, let me just read it. <laughs> now it came to pass, verse 1, when Jesus had finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, 
Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. That's Jesus' answer to their pointed question. They said to him, why then, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And what that's saying is Moses allowed you to do it because your hearts were hard. Verse 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Y'all missed the point. What he is saying is so profound and so strong and so mighty that, that they said, man, that's a tough saying, what you're saying. But he said to them, verse 11, all cannot accept these saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have, who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept, him, accept it, let him accept it. He is laying down the toughness of the, of the standard of what he is declaring. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2. That's the, that's the last book in the Old Testament. I'm saying it for the benefit of the person next to you because I know you know exactly where it is. Malachi chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Jot down. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offsprings. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce somebody say he hates divorce, he hates divorce. for it covers one's garment with violence says the Lord of hosts therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously God's heart about divorce is crystal clear he hates it let's go to 1st Corinthians chapter 7 then I'll be finished with this section and some of y'all will be so glad when I get out of this section right here. First Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 10 says, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband otherwise your children would be unclean but now they are holy but if the unbeliever departs let him depart a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases but God has called us to peace I need to talk about that verse for a minute because I feel somebody has drawn a conclusion that if they can get their spouse to leave, they won't be under bondage in such cases. <laughs> when it says you're not under bondage, it doesn't mean that you're free to go and get married to somebody else. I'm going to show you that in a minute, why that's true. What it means is you're not obligated to be responsible for fulfilling the expectation of the spouse so if your spouse leave your husband leave he can't come back and have sex with you you're not under the bondage or the responsibility to perform your duties because he left that's what that means and it doesn't mean that you you're free to go get married because it says God has called us to peace 
remarriage is not peace. Did y'all understand what I'm saying to you? I don't know anybody who's married who would call marriage peace. Okay, y'all, y'all are tough here today. Verse 39 says, a, a, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. Only in the Lord. Don't y'all go off and kill your husband. Look at your neighbors. Okay, let me roll on. I don't have, I don't have time for that. Let's go to number four. This is important. How do you know who you're supposed to marry? God's voice. Hear from God. Get a clear word from God. Have God communicate to you however God communicates to you. This is an important point. How does God talk to you? And however he talks to you, ask him to give you clarity. Beyond a, sh beyond a shadow of a doubt, get a clear word from God. And God communicates to us through various and sundry ways, through his word, through authorities in your life, through people, through preaching and teaching of the word, circumstances, spiritual gifts. However God communicates with you, have him give you clarity about whether or not this is his will for you. This is probably the most important thing in the world. Get, who you get married to is the most important decision you ever make other than accepting Jesus. And it's not like he wants to keep it secret or hidden from you. He wants you to have clarity about it. So discover who it is that God wants you to have. Ask him with clarity. And he will speak to you. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says, To obey God is better than any sacrifice that you can give him. Obedience is better than sacrifice. The most important thing you can do is obey the voice of the Lord. Hear from God and obey his voice. The Lord doesn't have delight in you sacrificing. He wants you to obey him. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And that's the most important thing. Here's my final point, point five. I call it the C check. Somebody say C checks. So what's the check? Don't determine your life partner based on the kind of car they drive, <laughs> what kind of curves they have, their countenance or their cuteness or how much cash they have. But that's what's, that's, those are the things that so many people look at. Child, he drive a nice car. Man, she got us some curves. Them curves ain't gonna stay curves. I don't care how cute they are. I don't care how handsome he looks. Some of the cutest people in the world got the nastiest attitudes. And you don't marry a person for cash. I want to read something to y'all. I had, Let me see if I can find this thing. Talk among yourselves for a moment. It's worthy of me just finding it. To, 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 this is something I want to read to you for just a moment. Can I what? Put number four? I don't know if I can back it up or not. You talking about that one? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. 
I can't go back to three. I don't think. Do you want that one part I went by? It just says, I believe in the sanctity of the marriage relationship. That's what you want. Okay, let me read this to y'all. It's, it's a little lengthy, but... A pretty... A young and pretty lady posted this on a popular forum. What should I do to marry a rich guy? I'm going to be honest of what I'm going to say here. This was in, it was in the paper. I'm 25 this year. I'm very pretty, have style and good taste. I wish to marry a guy with $500,000 annual salary or above. You might say that I'm greedy, but an annual salary of $1 million is, is considered only middle class in New York. My requirement is not high. Is there anyone in this forum who has income of $500,000 annual? <laughs> Are you all married? I wanted to ask, what should I do to marry a rich person like you? Among those I've dated, the richest is $250,000 annual, and it seems that this is my upper limit. If anyone is going to move into a high-cost residential area on the west of New York City Garden, 250,000 annual income is simply not enough. I'm here humbly to ask a few questions. Where do, where do most rich bachelors hang out? Please list down the names and addresses of bars, restaurants, and gyms. What age group should I target? What are most wives of the rich? Why are most wives of the rich only average looking? I have met a few women who don't have good, who don't have looks and are not interested, interesting, but they are able to marry rich guys. How do you decide who can be your wife and who can only be your girlfriend? My target is to get married. Sign Miss Pretty. <laughs> this, is, this was actually in a paper in New York and the CEO of JP Morgan responded, Dear Miss Pretty, I have read your post with great interest. Guess there are lots of guy, girls out there who have similar questions like yours. Please allow me to analyze your situation as a professional investor. My annual income is more than $500,000, which meets your requirements, so I hope everyone believes that I'm not wasting time here. From the standpoint of a business person, it is a bad decision to marry you. The answer is very simple, so let me explain. Put the details aside, what you're trying to do is an exchange of beauty and money. Person A provides beauty, person B pays for it, fair and square. However, there is a deadly problem here, your beauty will fade. <laughs> but my money will not be gone without a good reason. The fact is, my income might increase from year to year, but you can't be prettier year after year. <laughs> Hence, from my viewpoint of, econ of economics, I am an appreciating item, and you are a depreciating <laughs> asset. And it's not just normal depreciation, but exponential de depreciation. <laughs> if, that is, if that is your only asset, your value will be much worse 10 years later. By the terms we use in Wall Street, every trading has a position. Dating with you is also a trading position. If the trade value drops, we will sell it, and it is not a good idea to keep it for long term. <laughs> Same goes with the marriage you wanted. It might be cruel to say this, but in order to make a wiser decision, any asset with greater depreciation, with greater depreciation value will be sold or leased. Anyone with over $500,000 annual income is not a fool. We would only date you but not marry you. I would advise that you forget looking for any clues to marry a rich guy 
and by the way, you could make yourself to become a rich person with five, uh, you, you could make yourself to become a rich person with $500,000 annual income. This has a better chance than finding a rich fool. Sign, J.P. Morgan CEO. <laughs> Anyway, let me go to my next point. Um, my, I want to finish with these C's. I told you don't make these determinations or marrying somebody. But here's what you do use to determine. Do determine your life partner based on number one, compatibility. Do y'all have some things in common? Number two, character. Evaluate a person's character. I think that's important. Watch how they behave. Competence. Do they, do they, they, do they have the ability to hold a job? Communications. Can y'all communicate with each other? Can y'all relate? Can y'all connect? Do y'all understand? Does he listen? Does she listen? Children. Do y'all want to have children and how many? Cash management skills. Because how people manage cash is a killer. Continents. Y'all know what that means? Self-control. If they can't keep their hands off of you before you get married, there will be periods in marriage when sex will not be possible. And if they don't have self-control before, don't think they're going to all of a sudden get it after they get married to you. Finally, very important, cooking and cleaning. That was a joke, y'all. That was a joke. Okay, I'm way over my time. Any questions? We got some questions. Come to the mic real quick. Amen. Let me see if I got any email questions. Somebody asked on the internet, what if you don't have parents to give you blessings on the person you are courting? And I would say there's probably somebody in your life that played that mother or fatherly role or position that, that you respect, that God perhaps brought in your life that can play that role in your life. But there are other areas of authority in your life. There's several areas, church authority, job authority, the laws of the land, government authority so look for the the whole piece is about the authorities in your life and what do they what do they say see how god gives direction yes ma'am uh, hi pastor this is great this is perfect i was just talking to my mother about this so this is amazing um as a single person who has a lot of married friends we have conversations a lot about reasons to leave your spouse well they tell me i can't give advice because i'm not married but uh particularly about abuse and with um, some of them C's that they didn't check before they got married, right? So I heard what you said about divorce and God hates divorce and there, there's an, a clause, but are there any other reasons why divorce is an applicable situation, especially if there's an abuse situation or- If there's a what situation? Abuse, abuse. Okay. situation mm -hmm. or like I said, any of those C's are not checked. So you got married to somebody that God told you was not a good idea and you did it anyway? So it's a great question. Once you, once you enter into the institution of marriage, you enter into that institution. Pray before you get married, get the will of the Lord, get a word from God. It's very, very important. If you're being abused, call the police. <laughs> Have that person get help. They need help. 
and we want to believe God that they can get help to change their behavior and resolve whatever the issue is in that person internally right. that causes them to be abusive. So we're not telling anybody, I'm not telling anybody to stay in a physical abusive situation. Do not hear me say that, and I'm glad you asked that question. But I'm not telling you to divorce. What I am saying is help the person get help and get resolution to whatever the issues are that causes them to be abusive. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. Jenkins. Um, so my question is, if you're dating someone that has children, um, what level of approval or acceptance should the children have in the relationship? If, what now? if you're dating someone that has children, um, what role should the acceptance of the children play in the relationship? You know, children are children. Now there should be a strategy on helping the kids embrace or accept this new partner or this person that's coming into the union. So uh, most, mo unfortunately, most people who are coming into a blended family situation or where there's already children in the case don't have the training or the knowledge of how to help the kids embrace this new adult. And I would tell you, get help with that, as opposed to just saying, we the parents, we're just gonna do what we wanna do. You gotta learn how to help kids embrace and understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, you said early on that parental blessings is necessary, so to speak. Uh, can you step up to the mic so I can hear you? Proverb uh, 21, 1, Ephesians. Six one, you said parental blessings is important. Yes. Well, I'm from the old school, but as I got older, I realized that when it was time for me to get married, I didn't ask for her parents' blessings because I feel I'm not marrying them. But 19 years later, we're still together. So it works for some, it works. No, don't, don't dismiss the scriptures like that. I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let your ignorance of what you should have done become the rule. Please don't promote that. I, I'm That's not promoting not, it. I'm just saying. No, you, no you're saying because I didn't do this, then everybody, everybody don't have to do it. That's what you're saying. You're saying everybody don't have to do this. I didn't do it, and we're still together after 19 years, so everybody don't have to do that. That's what you're saying. Sort of, kind of, <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, look, we can't say that. We're not going to say that. Well, We're going to teach what's right. You should have you gone to them and asked for permission to marry them. But I feel that I didn't have to, so I didn't do it. But I hear what you're saying. I'm not saying the scripture is wrong, but what I'm saying is it didn't, I didn't do it that way. God was merciful to you, except thank God for mercy. Yeah. He was merciful, and you're still together, 19 years. Praise the Lord for that. But I would hope that once you learn the principles of God's word, that you teach your children and teach others that you should. Do you have any kids? Yes, two. You have a daughter? And a son. Okay, so would you want your daughter, Joker, to not come and ask your blessings on the marriage that he wants to tell? I see your, your face is twisted up here a little bit. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> You're right, and I agree, and that's why I'm saying my, 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 the way I started, is, is the way I'm thinking now is totally different. I agree, but I didn't start that way, and that's all I'm saying. Well, that's fine. You, God was merciful to you. It wasn't the right way, and I hope you teach your kids and your, your right son and say, tell, your, tell that joker to come and talk to me and get my blessings. Agreed. All right. Good evening, Pastor. I just want to ask on behalf of a sister in Christ. Um, before she married, she um, did not, she abstained from sex. But she once she, she did not have sex before she got married. But once she got married, her husband never consecrated the marriage. So what, what happens? Well, you know. <laughs> Come on, Pastor. Consummated. 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 Okay. Yes, please. She said, he never much. consecrated the marriage. <laughs> well, we can consecrate it right now if he wants to get it consecrated. What happens, what happens now? Well, how long has she been married? 
they they've been married a year a year maybe yeah that's a problem that's a serious Houston we have a problem here that's a problem they need to get help they need to get help unless there's some physical reason you know if there's some physical reason if there's no physical reason he has went to the doctor and um, the doctor said there's nothing really wrong and they need to get, they need she's to go at to, a place where they need to go get counseling okay. they need counseling yeah counseling Okay, this is the last question right here. I'm sorry. Okay. So I have a question around um, point four. And so I think a lot of times, especially when, um, you know, you're a woman in waiting, it's easy for you to get caught up in what you perceive to be God's voice. Um, and so I guess my question is, how do we differentiate God's voice from what may be just kind of our internal, or what, what is, or what could be our flesh, um, telling us that, oh, this so, is the one. So, yeah, that's a great question, and it's a great question. And in the bookstore, I have a, a series called Hearing the Voice of God. In, in that series, it's 10 different ways God speaks. Also in that series is the five things that distinguishes God's voice from mm -hmm. Satan's voice, how you can tell the difference. You got to get that. Okay. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here tonight.